Uh, good evening, everyone. If you're in the European time zone, at least <laughs> it's an evening. Uh, thank you for coming today. This is another meeting of SciComs Without Borders. And we, as usual, have a representative of one of interesting science communication and science engagement uh, projects with us today to share behind the scenes and know-hows with us. And later on, after the presentation, we will have a Q&A session and then we will have a networking session. Uh, Q&A will be recorded and then it will be published on YouTube for people who could not join today, but uh, we will have also networking off the record. So you will be able to turn on your cameras and tell us a bit more about your projects. It's always very interesting to see who are joining our uh, meetings and there's always a lot to learn from you. And with this, I invite Clara to take on the stage and Clara, please tell a few words about yourself and then uh, you're welcome to share the presentation and start with your talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, um, Victoria. So yeah, my name is um, Clara or Delphine Clara Zemp. Um, so actually I'm from France and Switzerland and I'm currently living in Germany since um, yeah, more than eight years already. Um, yeah, I'm a researcher, a scientist working at the University of Göttingen since about four years. And um, yeah, since a few years I started uh, to do also some outreach, not just science, but uh, try to communicate the science uh, to broaden audience and uh, also with uh, several of my friends, including Yuba who's here um, and Anastasia. We also um, started to create this initiatives, uh, Lectures Without Borders. So yeah, that's um, what I've been asked to briefly talk about today. So. Um, yeah, I, I prepared some slides, but I also hope this will be a bit less uh, formal and that um, there will be some discussions because for me it's also nice to have the opportunity to discuss with other people who are interested in outreach and to, um, yeah, to have more lively discussion than just uh, me talking and, and my slides. So, Great. yeah. I don't know what else. Sure, just share the slides and then okay. we talk more and I'm sure I, I will have tons of questions and I guess others will have <laughs> as well. Okay. So share screen. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, great. So yeah, um, as I mentioned, I will talk about lectures without borders, but actually within these uh, initiatives, I'm mainly responsible or mainly um, interested in environmental education. So I'm gonna specifically talk about that, um, but I will uh, still give you a brief overview of uh, the organizations and who is behind it, but we go rather briefly uh, on this. So yeah, here, um, here we are. So these are the four major um, people behind the um, uh, foundation, the, the creation of the um, non-governmental organization that is Lectures Without Borders. So yeah, there is Yuba who is also here with us. She's, a, she's actually a mathematician and she's now currently living in France. Uh, yeah, me, as I said, uh, mainly interested in bio, biodiversity, geography, uh, currently sitting at the University of uh, Göttingen in Germany. And then we have uh, Misha, uh, who is a, a math teacher uh, sitting in Munich, and um, Athanasia, uh, who is from Greece and who is a physicist working in Italy. So as you see, we have very diverse backgrounds. We have very different people, also in terms of interest, um, in terms of origin and so on. Uh, but still, we, uh, we really enjoy working together and um, discussing the strategy behind Lectures Without Borders. And so, yeah, we meet once a month, more or less, so it depends, of course. But yeah, the funny thing is, uh, until now, we never met physically altogether. So we, since two years, we, we coordinate, we communicate uh, online mainly. And of course, we enjoy meeting from time to time, but never, never really uh, all at the, at the same place. So that also means that this remote online um, um, organization is actually possible. And yeah, here is um, just to give you a brief overview of what Lectures Without Borders is about. 
So actually, it uh, started in, in 2017, um, as Luba traveled to, to Nepal, and she gave there a, a talk in um, local schools about mathematics and uh, climate science, together with uh, some of her colleagues. And I think um, that's what triggered the whole idea of um, better connecting scientists to schools, because uh, scientists used to travel a lot for several reasons, either going to conferences or for holidays or meeting other colleagues in different countries. And um, yeah, this is a very nice opportunity that we just we don't just travel, but also use this this moment of traveling to to do also some outreach and so and spread science um, in the world and in particular in uh, different schools. Um, so this is basically how. Um, how Lectures Without Borders is, is organized or is working at least before the COVID crisis. So the idea is that we help scientists to, uh, to find schools wherever they travel. So if scientists tell us um, their destinations and the time when they want to go somewhere, then we try to match their travel plans with um, with local schools, so we have um, actually local coordinator who are in charge of um, matching this. Um, and we also try to find schools who are interested in hosting scientists. Um, and so this is a real uh, coordination work that involves a lot of um, yeah, emailing and so on. And there are actually two people working part time uh, on this coordination for the scientists and for the schools. Um, yeah, just here some overview of uh, our activities. So these are uh, rough numbers, but just showing that uh, our activities are increasing in the last years and we hope to, to continue doing so in the future. So we, we do organize a lot of um, lectures, either physically uh, in classrooms or um, outside, as I will give you some examples, but also recently more uh, online. And um, yeah, that's uh, just some visualization. And here also to give you an overview of where we actually do most of our, our activities. Uh, these are the countries where so far we have mainly been involved or mainly been active. So these are a few countries in different continents, but um, we are always interested in um, reaching other countries depending on the, the people who approach us, um, the contact that we have and trying to expand our network uh, based on our local partnerships. So yeah, um, of course interrupt me if there is anything you would like to know more, but um, if it's not the case maybe I'll... Um, Let's continue and then I think we yeah. ask more. Okay. So maybe I, I will talk about um, the aspect where I'm personally more involved in, in the uh, organization Lectures Without Borders. And this is about environmental education. And in particular, I've been conducted several activities in Indonesia in the field. So the question, why Indonesia? Well, um, as you probably know, this is a hotspot of um, deforestation of tropical forests here. This is a view of one of the few remaining forests uh, in, in Sumatra, Indonesia. And for example, uh, you see adjacently here an old palm plantation. And of course, you're all aware of the ecological crisis that is associated to this deforestation and replacement of forests by plantations for different agricultural production. And so this is the topic that uh, me and other researchers address in our research projects. So we are uh, scientists from different disciplines, um, ecology, environmental science, social science, geography, humanities, and so on. About 200 people from Germany and Indonesia um, working collaboratively on this topic of uh, rainforest transformation in, in Sumatra, Indonesia. So this, uh, here is the, the islands um, of Sumatra, of the archipelago in, in, um, in Indonesia here. So uh, within, within this project, uh, where I've been involved since 2016, I mainly coordinated a, an experiment in open plantation that consists of planting multiple tree species and we try to see what is the influence 
of biodiversity enrichment or restoration of land. So this is more my research question of how to make all plant plantation more sustainable. Um, but of course, this is also a great opportunity to use our experimental area as a platform for um, education, for outreach, um, because we actually have several of these plots, these experimental plots, where we every day do some kind of measurements and where all the field assistants are, are working. So we know very well the, the environment. We have already our, um, our activities happening. So it was kind of straightforward to do activities um, with local schools in this research site. So in 2018, I organized um, an excursion, an outdoor activity for half a day. Uh, and so I brought about 20 students from local schools nearby the place where we established our experiment. Um, and these students could come to our sites, uh, spend half a day there. And the idea was really to first give them the opportunity to spend some time in the nature. Because some of them do not necessarily um, go so much in, in forests or in agroforests. It's not something very common as it is uh, in Europe, for example, to go um, to the forest just for recreation or so on there. It's not so, not so common. So especially the children are not so used to, to go to the forest and, and enjoy uh, nature. So that was basically the main motivation. And of course, we want also to bring some science in this activity. So together with my um, assistants, my colleagues and my friends, we organized several activities, um, basically some games and also some drawing where children could uh, have an insight or have a, an overview of how, of what kind of research we actually do in the field. So for example, in our research, we try to monitor how the litter layer changes and, and how this affects nutrient cycling. So without going into detail, we, we did some activities of, um, recognizing, for example, the kind of litter with the surrounding trees so that they can understand that the, these leaves actually fall from the trees and that they contribute to uh, soil uh, formation and so on. We also did some kind of uh, herbarium here um, where the children could try to identify some of the trees that are located in our plots and so they could compare the the, the plants that they found around them with these herbariums. We had several of these herbariums installed a bit everywhere in the sites. And this was also a bit fun for them to try to match the, the leaves that they found with, with this herbarium. So actually it was, it was quite fun. It was, um, it was pretty successful, although it was a, yeah, kind of a, a first experience for all of us. But I think it was, uh, it was really nice from both sides. And um, yeah, here's um, some other activities that we did um, more inside the house where we, for example, used the leaves um, to create some, some uh, colorful herbarium here. This is actually the drawing that the students, the children made um, so that they could learn a bit about biodiversity, how to recognize biodiversity and what these different trees are used for uh, and so on. And there, what was very important for me is to involve, to involve the local uh, lecturers also. So, for example, she's a partner from Jambi University in Sumatra. And uh, it was very nice to, to do this together. So not just us European teaching uh, the, the children there, but, but really a real exchange, a real collaboration. Can I ask a question here, Clara? Yeah. Uh, how was it with the language? So did you always speak English to your kids and how did they, what, what yeah. they put in English? Yeah, actually, um, that's a good question because uh, I spent almost two years in Indonesia so I could learn um, the basics of Indonesian. Mm. And so that also, of course, helped uh, to communicate. So I tried to, to speak in Indonesia, but uh, we did a bit of a mix. So I think it's also nice for them to hear a bit of English. They're not so much used to speak to foreigners or speak to um, yeah, um, people who, who practice English a lot. So I think it's, it's also an opportunity for them to, to, to hear some English. So especially if we do this together with local um, people, we can, we can translate or we can, um, mm. we can do a bit of, of both languages. 
Um, okay, and then yeah, we did some some more activities. So that was a few months later. I think half a half a year later. Um, this time we did activities in the city of of Jambi, um, which is a very big city, and um, yeah, there there are many schools where children have not so much the opportunity to learn about ecology. In fact, it's not um, part of their curricula so far. And so, yeah, I thought it would be it would be fun. It would be nice to bring a bit the uh, the concept, the the idea of forest ecology in the classroom. And we did this with uh, local initiatives that is um, called Class Inspiracy Jambi. And this is an Indonesian project that aims to um, give the children the opportunity to interact with a lot of different professionals. So they invited a range of different people from different um, jobs, kind of. And here I represented the science or the, the forest ecology parts, but there were all other people like architects or um, yeah, other kinds of profession. And the idea was um, to show the children what kind of jobs they could imagine um, having later. So that was basically the idea of this initiative. And I thought it would be nice um, to bring this, this um, forest ecology and, and how research um, looks like. So in this case, um, we created some activities where I actually used material from my own research. So for example, here, this is a, an image of a laser scan from the forest that I use for my own, um, yeah, for my own research and publications to look, for example, at the vegetation structure and so on. And I try to bring a bit of this science uh, in the classroom and, and uh, here the children could draw what kind of um, animals or uh, fruits or colors they could imagine in the forest. And, and we discuss a bit about biodiversity in forests, uh, in their forest, in our forest in Europe. And yeah, it was also a bit of a storytelling um, to, to have real interactions not just me talking in front of the board, but really um, have a real exchange as much as possible. So yeah, I, I think what was also nice with these activities was quite efficient because um, in half a day, we reached four different classes and there was a rotation. So I was with each class for one hour doing this activity. And then after the hour was over, I moved to the next class and did uh, other activities. And each class had different age. So um, of course it was a bit challenging to adapt the material and the activity to the different ages, but I think it's, it's a nice way to have a really efficient day somehow that we can, we can, do, we can reach out uh, many different children. And here is a few more pictures from, from this day. So this is actually a colleague of us who is working on, um, on insect identification. And here um, he brought some of his own samples from his own research to the classroom. And um, these children here looked actually for the first time into a microscope and, and looked at this um, funny insect. So I think it was really fun for them to, to see how it can look like from a really macro perspective. Um, and yeah. So yeah, this, these were the main activities that we did. Um, so uh, yeah, the question now is what we plan to do next. And so um, what is important for me is to do the long-term um, activity. So not just do it once and then leave, but really to have something uh, running even after we leave. And for that, we really collaborate with the, in particular with the local, um, student association. So here, for example, you see uh, our friends, our, our colleagues here in, in Sumatra, who themselves are very much interested in nature and interested in science also, because they are most of them uh, working the project as field assistant for many years. And now I try to um, yeah, um, help them, support them, that they can organize their own uh, excursions and that they can take over this activity and also have a financial benefit from this. So basically they can also live from, from this activity. So try to organize this uh, on, on the long term. 
And um, I also started, or we started discussing with a range of different experts. For example, here some person involved in the, in the ministry who are in charge of environmental education in Madagascar. I've been also talking with um, experts in didactics of biology and so on. And we, we try to get uh, ideas of how to develop materials in a way that is really adapted, uh, really appropriate to the specific needs in the different countries and how to make it really um, high quality. So this is important to discuss with experts. And then now we expand in other regions. So we've been discussing with a range of different colleagues from Ghana, from Madagascar. And also now recently we, we got a project to, to do some activities in France, Russia. And uh, yeah, of course, with the current situation it's getting a bit more complicated to do these excursions. But um, for example, on the website, if you can, I don't know if I probably cannot because I'm sharing my screen, but I can send you the link. Yeah. Um, where, where there is a virtual excursion. So, of course, here I could benefit from the fact that this is a big research project and we have lots of videos from drones and so on. And, and uh, we could compile a um, nice video where people can actually visit the site virtually. And that's also something that we can use actually uh, in different places and, and it's quite nice to, to do for the future. Yeah, I think that's all from my side. And of course, yeah, happy to stay in touch if you have ideas or if you want to collaborate on, on any regions or any topic, always welcome. Yeah, thanks a lot. Cool, thank you very much, Clara. Uh, maybe you could share the link in the chat for the virtual yeah. versions. I think it's very interesting for many of us. Um, I'll stop sharing. And we are with this open to questions. So if you have a question, you're welcome to turn on your microphone and camera if you're not shy and ask or write in the chat if that is better for you and me or maybe Luba will read them. Probably I will read because Luba is on the phone, so it might be more treat. Yeah, no, I, I, I can take over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I remember that, um, yeah, uh, I I said uh, in the beginning of the webinar also that yeah if you if you feel free to also present yourself before to ask the question so that we know with whom we speak because it's always good to learn uh, who is interested in this topic because the the reason we wanted to share it with you is to learn more about your associations or projects. Um, or, I mean, maybe Victoria, you can ask first because I think you're your next sure. word in these actions and you, you always know what you're, what you can. I always have many questions. Yes. So <laughs> for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Victoria. I currently live in Munich. I was involved with uh, different science communication projects over the last years, mostly in Germany. Um, and while I know how to like uh, present science in an understandable way to high, quite well-educated public in Germany, I actually never was involved in any outreach activities, especially going to schools, especially going to schools in um, non-Western countries. So I'm wondering how to even start with this. Like, how did you contact schools? How did you find people who would support you locally to? Uh, to bring these activities to kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, actually, um, in, in my case, as I mentioned, this is a project where I've been working on in my research anyway. So it's, it's mm. my research site. I spend a lot of time in Indonesia and, and before that in Brazil or in Vietnam. So actually, it's part of my, of my work to, to go to these different places because it's my research topic. Um, and of course, that makes it easier because uh, it, and it also makes sense because that's where uh, I, I know the local culture, I can, um, I, I meet a lot of people and interact with them and so we start uh, exchanging ideas and actually I realized that many of them also have a lot of cool ideas and also initiatives so yeah it's, it's basically just by spending time there and, and talking to people there but yeah so that's just for my own experience uh, but I think yeah. But I, still I, how does it happen? 
I mean, scientists often go to a, somewhere where, like for expedition, they do their job and then they leave. And it's not necessarily that they meet locals. How yeah. did you do it differently? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> this is, um, I mean, yeah, maybe also related to my personality that I'm always trying to, to integrate wherever I am as much as possible. So try to, to meet locals whenever possible. Of course, sometimes there is a lot of barriers, the language or like cultural difference that you don't know how to approach people, how, how to, what are the rules, social norms and so on. So mm. I guess you just learn by doing. And um, yeah, I, I think the most important is, is to be open and to be interested. And if you have this, um, and of course time, because you need to spend some time to have the opportunity to meet the right person with whom you will collaborate so that all, all take some time. You cannot meet the right person in, in just uh, half a day if you, yeah, if you are there for the first time and nobody's introducing you. So yeah, in my case, I spent a lot of time there, like more than half, uh, one and a half years, um, but could be done also differently. For example, if uh, um, that, that's what we try to do in, in Lectures Without Borders, that we have local coordinators who contact uh, different schools or different um, scientists from here by email and so on and, and try to facilitate the connection. But of course, it's, it's way easier if you are yourself there and, and spend time there. Mm -hmm. I'm also wondering about the funding. So uh, from what you showed, probably did not require much funding from, to organize these activities. Uh, but uh, did the organizations you work with, like research organizations, have any special funding for outreach? that you could use? Um, yes, actually, we, we used uh, quite a bit of funding, uh, mainly for the transportation of the children. Mm -hmm. So we rented this uh, four by four cars and also uh, hired uh, people who could yeah, drive the car, prepare the picnic and so on. So it was uh, in the end quite a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, people involved and, and, and some quite of funding. And yeah, in our case, we, we got the support from our scientific project. So mm -hmm. they are themselves uh, interested in outreach because it's actually a project that is funded by the, the DFG, so the German Research Foundation. And usually uh, they are always happy to, to support also some kind of outreach. But of course, it's always marginal. It's like a small side thing. But in general, for this project, it's not so difficult to, to get some small funding for, for this kind of activity. Mm -hmm. um, but now for the longer term, for example, now what I mentioned, what I would like to do is um, like supporting local assistants that, or, or local students who can really take over on the long term and do it more regularly and so on. And this is then a bit detached from the scientific project. And in that case, we need, yeah, we need additional funding. So, for example, with Lectures Without Borders, we, we have the chance to get some financial support from different foundations. And, and this can, can be used then, but um, otherwise, I guess, crowdfunding or I'm sure there are a range of options. If that mm -hmm. answers the, the question. Yeah. I, I don't know how you guys, uh, how you do it usually if, if you also have some foundation support for your outreach activities or if this is a science project that, that pays for it. If I talk about myself and the projects that I was involved with, mostly these were, uh, first of all, mostly it was pretty low maintenance I mean, in terms of finances. So we did things in the cheapest way possible. We would find mm -hmm. uh, organizations that would give us something for free, like location for the event for free, mm -hmm. um, something help us promote ourselves and so on. And then the small funding that we got were either coming from research organizations here in Munich, as you say correctly, it is often that grants have this uh, outreach budget and then you can mm -hmm. ask for it and then they often are happy because mm -hmm. the institute did not really take care of doing anything specific, but then they want to put something in their yeah, report. And then they say, okay, we give you money, put our logo, make some pictures that we can write this in the report. Yeah. And uh, on a couple of occasions, we were able to get some funding uh, private from our uh, companies. 
but this is a bit more tricky and honestly i think there is a bit big uh space for or there are many opportunities but you need to be quite persistent and spend some time on this figure good companies that might be interested in your audience mm -hmm. and then make a good deal for them to show what are the benefits if they support yeah. you mm -hmm. Often just the logo is not enough. Often they need mm. more exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is also possible. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. I, I know, for example, um, I don't know where, where all of you are based, but um, in Germany, I'm not sure, but in Switzerland, I've recently checked, and I, I think there are also special funding from the look, I mean, the National Research Foundation that is different from most of the research projects program. It's kind of a different program that is just based for outreach. So that also exists in, in some countries. Based, I mean, it's, um, it's state money, so it's public, mm -hmm. public money. Yeah, I, I, there are grants also from the government, uh, are the state or from the city sometimes also, but I, 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 we did never, mm -hmm. we did not really explore it because it also takes time to find out how to do this yeah. and write it properly and write it mm -hmm. in German in a good German <laughs> <laughs> for us. Um, but then maybe in the future this mm -hmm. will happen. Do others have some questions? Yeah, I have one. <laughs> Hi, my name is Marina. Uh, I'm a PhD student uh, in Ariel University, a small city in Israel. Uh, I'm studying neurobiology. So mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, I had some ideas also. Uh, did you think about uh, to find maybe talented students, uh, pupils, uh, which can be interested exactly in your uh, specific area and uh, do a long project with them? So are you not talking uh, students at the university level or? Um, no, no, school, school. Uh, school. Mm -hmm. So you mean some kind of collaboration? You have something specific in mind? Uh, I don't know. I like coaching them. Like coaching yeah, yes, students, yes, right? yes. To, so to put uh, there to the, to the way. Uh -huh. Okay, mentoring, yeah. Okay, that's, yes. uh, that's interesting. Actually, so far, I've never been in touch um, longer with the children with whom I did this activity than after the activity. In most of the cases, they were also a bit shy, so they interacted with me when they were asked a question or something like that. But it's not, I mean, so far at least, um, I didn't have any students who came and, and who wanted to stay in touch or, or anything. But of course, I mean, that would be really, really fun. Uh, I'm not sure, do you have uh, yeah. this kind of... We, we are open we are open for it right but we indeed we put our forces so far right correct me if i'm wrong Delphine, to other things sorry for for interrupting yeah, yeah i mean it depends i guess it's also sometimes um can be also personally interesting to have like a real exchange yeah i i, I don't know um me what is the name of uh, sorry what is your name marina <laughs> I Marina, did, uh, yes. did, did you have this kind of uh, long-term exchange? No, I thought about it, uh, about uh, this, because uh, when I was uh, at school, it was uh, really hard to uh, believe that you can be a scientist uh, outside of the country. I'm from the, from the very small city in Russia, and mm -hmm. I was living in, um, out of the city, and it was like, okay, I have a future in the uh, next shop <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to work like a cashier, so... <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but, uh, you know, some steps and uh, I'm here in Israel and it's so exciting uh, to uh, sharing this with other people, but I don't mm -hmm. have any idea how to find these uh, talented <laughs> yeah. school boys yeah. and girls. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. actually in my case it's mainly the long-term contact that I have is mainly from the uh, student university, so the, the more older people like 20, 25 or so. And uh, in this case, yeah, I have regularly um, contact with them and many of them are actually interested in doing PhD or interested in research, but they're confused how to start or 
um, what to apply for. And, and in this case, I, I try to provide advice and, and to support mm. them, to motivate. Yeah, yeah. That's, but that's more at but, the, the latest stage. Uh, but actually, stage. just to mention that actually, Marina, maybe for you, it may be interesting if you're interested in, in doing set, you may contact Anastasia, uh, who is our uh, right coordinator, and she did a lot of contacts with schools around the globe. And so with some schools, she has almost personal connections. I mean, not almost, but they know her. They call her like in the evening or something. So it may be a good idea uh, there, right? Sometimes director of a, of a school can say, you know, this person, he is like, he, he, he wants to, right, to become a, like, he, he wants to, to study more so we can organize more webinars for them. We were doing the recent webinars for Tver or Tambov and Tambov, and those students, they were really, really attentive. It was incredible. Like, I, I, was, I was really happy that we found connections to those small, small schools, but it's, it was a really good experience. Yeah, it's okay. There were, only, there were only several lectures. They were not like long term, but only like a course, a small course. But it's possible. Yeah, like you can Thank come you. to the <laughs> website, and uh, we will we will answer you as soon as we can. You Thank have you. some ideas. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Any other question. questions? Okay, I, I see someone joining from the phone, and let me try unmute this person and see. If is there anyone is... else in the among the people who are here also I doing uh, environmental education, or are you working on different topics? Yeah, Marina, what are you working on? <laughs> uh, I'm a neurobiologist. <laughs> neurobiologist. Okay. Yes. <laughs> So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, I think, pretty hard to work with uh, school boys and girls in this uh, field because uh, it's really, it's even s some students uh, not so close uh, to this field. So, and mm -hmm. I'm electrophysiologist, it's more, the <laughs> mm -hmm. it's uh, more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> but I think uh, uh, there is people who really can be interested, who like uh, electricity and biology and uh, physics, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually had one scientist who was neuroscientist and he made a lecture in Nepal when he traveled there. And students, uh, not so many students understood what he was explaining, but they were totally <laughs> inspired, right? So it, it may be that, uh, it may be unclear, but uh, to make a contact it can be good. <laughs> well, I believe you can explain neuroscience in a very understandable way and neurobiology just takes a bit of extra effort. And it is yeah. tricky when you have never talked to people outside of, or you rarely talk to people outside of your field. Mm -hmm. And when you rarely talk to kids, then you kind of lose this intuition of how little mm -hmm. people actually know. But then if, if you have uh, was if you're dedicated, then you can learn or teach yourself, or you can learn how to explain it in an understandable way. Yeah. Actually, I but, had a small experience. Sorry, <laughs> uh, no, no, I worked in a um, um, big center in Russia, in Sochi. Uh, it's named Sirius. It's for talented. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, students from all of the Russia. So uh, I worked in bio biological lab and uh, every day I uh, worked with different uh, uh, ages from young to very old people and tried to explain them today how to work in microscope, today how to do, uh, how to work with the bacteria. Uh, today, and oh, every day it was uh, different and it was very interesting because uh, uh, people was uh, excited to how, how to say to touch science even little bit, but uh, it was really really interesting. And of course, I meet I meet a lot of uh, very talented uh, students. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, there was uh, 
they know more than me in uh, some fields and they were very young like 15 mm -hmm. 16 years old <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, usually these Clara. people have the scientific parents then, no? who push them or not necessarily. Mm. Clara, I was curious if you ever done anything for your home country or your or home city or your university community. Yeah, yeah, actually uh, since 2012, like almost every year I joined this um, um, a long night of science. So it's uh, once a year in Germany, there is an event where uh, the door of the research institute and university are open and we organize activities for general public. So it's uh, children, but also any kind, any, anyone, any random person who, who is interested can, can enter. And then we also prepared games and, and different uh, presentations, videos uh, and so on. And usually it's always uh, yeah very interesting to, to talk to, to people like completely outside and um, and also when I was a bit younger I did uh, camp summer camps in Switzerland uh, twice but it was not necessarily oriented to science it was more um, mm. different activities outside so yeah these are my experience actually I've discussed with some of the um, um, uh, yeah, um, outreach activities in, in biology or in biodiversity in Switzerland. And my impression was, was really funny because I had the feeling that it is so regulated, like it seems impossible to reach schools there. Oh. They say, why? Yeah, I mean, it, why? Why? Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 it seems, you know, there's like sometimes uh, Swiss regulations that they have this fixed uh, curricula and they have their fixed programs already so much planned ahead. And also the, if you want to bring them outside, there is so many things, uh -huh, administrative okay. steps, yeah. and it's so complicated that, uh, yeah, I mm. mean, at least until now, um, it didn't, didn't happen. But I know, of course, there are some like, organizations uh, in Switzerland and in France who actually specialize yeah. in doing um, yeah, field excursions uh, for schools. But this have like a long term collaboration with also, I guess, the, the, the educational um, administration or I, I don't know how they work, but in my case, it was, mm -hmm. uh, it was they were not so open with the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we had the same problem, right, in France in some way, like some, t some teachers, if they know the way, they will make it easy to invite you to school mm -hmm. and so on. But sometimes you need to know people in the department, right? Like mm -hmm. of their education, like uh, mm -hmm. someone. <laughs> in, mm. in Eastern Europe, I had an impression it was easier, at least like for Belarus or, or Russia, but mm -hmm. it, it depends. I don't know, in Indonesia, how is it in Indonesia? It's easier, right? Um, actually, I didn't so much take care of that Part because there, there mm -hmm. was mainly the, um, the local uh, coordinator who, like mm -hmm. the research coordinator who took care of this and she's a very influential person so I guess it was okay. uh, very easy for her to use her position uh, to, to, to kind of yeah, convince people and mm -hmm. um, yeah I don't know you, you, generally I think so far I had the impression that they, they were always uh, very very happy to receive externals and, and also foreigners of course that's also something that people are always interested to to meet or so on because it's not so common there to to meet foreigners so if you say that you want to organize a um, excursion with europeans uh, some some people are interested just because of that which sometimes i find weird but maybe that's also yeah uh, yeah mm -hmm. i don't know if you had um, some similar experience elsewhere and and how to break these these barriers of uh, of people who just want to to meet you because you are you are from outside. Mm. Well, I think there are good reasons why schools are regulated, right? Because they try to mm -hmm. protect kids from absolutely bad things. So I yeah, think absolutely. 
it then makes sense probably that it, there are certain barriers that you need to go yeah. through. Yeah, 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 I'm not sure, but. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I suggest that we, at this point, I stop recording. Mm -hmm. And we invite everyone for a more relaxed uh, net networking <laughs> and discussion.